This carburetor has no jets, automatically compensates for altitude and temperature changes, makes more power than a stock carburetor, all while being more economical and looking absolutely stunning in the process. Isn't that exactly what your bike is missing? Well, like all good things, there are a few caveats. We live in a world with smartphones, smart watches, smart TVs, and even smart speakers. Computer, is it a good day to ride? Every day is a good day to ride. So it's definitely time that we had smart carbs, right? Well, of course, you could argue that that's exactly what electronic fuel injection is. But Smart Carb, the company, disagree and created this, the Smart Carb SC2. Full disclosure, Smart Carb sent me this carburetor for my Yamaha YZ250 for free so that I could test it out and share my thoughts with you guys in this video. However, I am free to tell you that it's complete rubbish if it actually is. Now, there is a lot to cover on this one. So instead of boring you with a never-ending monologue, spitting facts and figures at you, kind of like this, I decided to compile a list of questions that I would expect any good biker to ask me about the carb. Had I actually consulted you, that is. About as many as are currently in your garage, because it's easily a one-man operation. It was much faster and easier than I expected and really didn't require the procrastination that I gave it. Once you've enjoyed the beautiful unboxing experience, you first have to remove your stock carb. I also removed the subframe to get better access and since the air boot will need modifying in any case. And all you need to be left with is the bare throttle cable. The new cap, spring and slide can then be installed onto the throttle cable and tightened up. If your reed intake boot has any alignment tabs like my YZ did, you will need to first trim them off so that the carb can sit flush. It's important to ensure that the slide has its full range of motion. Otherwise, you can adjust the throttle cable slack on top of the carb or at the throttle itself. The cable is then very close to the frame. Since the smart carb is both taller and wider than the stock carb, but it doesn't hinder the movement of the cable in any way. And then the throttle position sensor can be plugged in while the other cable is left blank. The rear of the carb has a vent scoop that needs to be open to function. However, the YZ has a lip in its air boot that would block this, so it needs to be trimmed. Not all bikes would need trimming, but it's just the top bit that needs to go. I may have gone a bit overboard with it, but I didn't want it to be blocked at all. So with the subframe back on and the air boot tightened up, I could give it some fuel. The fuel line was now a tiny bit short, but thankfully the included fuel filter made up the difference. Unfortunately, I didn't fix the direction of the filter quickly enough to avoid rude YouTube comments. The larger carb does leave the air boot very close to the rear shock. However, smart carb have addressed this and say it only touches at full swing arm extension and shouldn't wear through it. You don't. Just because a Keyhin or even a Lectron carb need to look like this doesn't mean all carbs need to. And that is what makes the SC2 so good looking. Alongside its beautiful machining that is. All it has is one hose to the fuel tank and one drain hose in case you need to drain the float bowl. There's also a choke on the correct side, an idle set screw and a clicker adjuster on the top. This clean design is possible because it's all internally vented, which is brilliant because it means there is never any fuel spillage. You can lean your bike over like this to wash underneath it or if there are no trees around to lean your bike against without fuel pouring all over the floor. In a word, magic. But in reality, it uses the design invented by a chap called William Edmonston. It's kind of the same concept as used by Lectron Carbs, but with Smart Carbs' own unique improvements. Instead of a needle, the carb has a metering rod. 
which is flat on the side that faces the engine and curved on the intake side. So as air rushes past the metering rod, there is an area of low pressure created on the flat side of the rod that ultimately pulls fuel up from the float pole. This is also how it compensates for altitude changes, because obviously the higher the altitude, the less air there is. Therefore, there is a weaker signal on the metering rod, bringing up less fuel from the float pole, creating the perfect mixture. And since fuel can rise so high up the metering rod thanks to this effect, it increases atomization of the fuel, meaning it burns cleaner, makes more power, all while being more economical. Obviously, there is a lot more to it than this, but this is the basic principle of how it functions without jets and how it compensates for altitude changes. Not even. All you need is your favorite local track or trails, and then you have two knobs at your disposal. The idle screw works like a regular carb, raising or lowering the slide to let more or less fuel into the engine. But the metering rod can be raised or lowered with the clicker adjustment on the top of the carb, which exposes more or less of the tapered rod and opening or closing the gap where fuel exits the float bowl. So you can tune your bike while you ride with just your fingers, no tools required. To change the metering rod height, you just kill the engine, pin the throttle and press down the clicker adjuster which slots an allen key into the top of the slide. Then, with the clicker depressed, you can turn it, which changes the rod height. Left for leaner and right for richer. So when you order your carb, they request information like what fuel and premix ratio you use, as well as what engine modifications you've done to your bike, so that they can then set the baseline settings on the carb to give you a good starting point before it's even shipped to you. I've seen people's bikes start right up and run perfectly out of the box. However, mine started first kick after my install, but wouldn't idle and had very low power down low. Which in my ignorance, I assumed meant it was too lean and needed more fuel to make more power. I should probably mention that I've never actually tried to tune a carb before, but luckily the manual was very good at explaining what I needed to do to get my new carb to run correctly. But it wasn't quite as useful as having direct help from someone that works at Smart Carb. So luckily Nathan was more than happy to message me back and forth to help me understand how my new carb works. Now this isn't special treatment because I'm making a video about this. I've seen plenty of people on forums talking about getting help from Nathan or other people at SmartCob. It was a little bit tricky with the time difference from here to America, but it did make my life a lot easier. So this is how my tuning experience went down. First, it wouldn't idle and had low power down low. So I went four clicks richer because in my mind, more fuel meant more power. But this didn't work. Nathan then told me that they shipped the carbs on the richer side to prevent engine damage. So I should go leaner until my revs start to pick up. Turns out I was going in the wrong direction. But nevertheless, I do appreciate that they shipped them on the richer side to protect my engine. 36 clicks later, my bike would idle and run brilliantly throughout the rev range. However, I wasn't sure if 36 clicks was on the excessive side, so I went in search of some advice. According to my new best friend Nathan, 36 clicks was above average. However, they didn't have any experience with my local fields. After all, I don't think they've ever shipped one to South Africa. So I followed his advice and went a few clicks richer while compensating with the idle set screw for the bottom end. Because the metering rod adjustments affect the entire power curve, so better to be richer up top to be safe. Well, that's exactly what I did on day two. I thought I was making it better, messing around with any adjustment I could find, but it's not a problem. 
In fact, I think they kind of expect you to do that because they put all the original settings on the back of the manual. So you can revert your slide height and metering rod height back to the starting point if need be. However, if the bottom end is perfect, but the top end isn't quite right, that is when you'd swap out the metering rod for one with a slightly different taper that is just a circlip removal away. And although this process is only required during the initial setup of the carb, I still couldn't imagine having to open up the carb and remove the slide every time I wanted to make a little metering rod adjustment like you do on Electron, especially at a dusty track. I couldn't have opened my carb 18 times to make two click adjustments at a time just to get to the 36 clicks that I needed. I thought so too, but their website guides you through the process. First, you tell it what bike you have, and it tells you what size carb you will need, like I needed the 38mm. Then you can choose whether you want the TPS or not, and customize your float ball color to match your bike if you fancy. And lastly, you provide your engine modifications and fuel info, and that's it. Honestly, nothing. I wasn't interested in the SC2 because the stock carb was bad, I'm just intrigued by the technology and innovation of a very old part. I always thought my bike was running a tad rich, but because it was running nicely, I didn't want to mess with it in case I made it worse. Jets are Greek to me, but the SC2 makes learning and changing settings much easier. I also like the idea that I could leave my house in Johannesburg at 1600 meters above sea level and go ride a track in Cape Town down at sea level without having to change jets or figure jets out. That's how life has always been for me riding fuel injected bikes, so it's kind of a first world expectation. Yes, but with the SC2, it kills the planet slightly less. Its incredible fuel atomization enables it to burn 25 to 30 percent less fuel than the stock carb while making 8 to 14 percent more power. As for the power, my buttometer isn't sensitive enough or talented enough to really notice, but I definitely used less fuel. In fact, I could just make out the fuel level in the tank after a morning at the track, whereas normally I wouldn't even catch a glimpse of it and need to top it up quite a bit. Honestly, there's no catch. It just depends on whether it works for you or not. If you change altitude frequently or even within a ride, you'll love it. If you want your bike to look better and you can afford it, you'll love it. If you're just intrigued by the innovation like I am, you'll love it. If you're racing and looking for marginal gains, you will love it. And even if you're just sick of stripping Phillips screws, you'll love it. But chances are, if none of these things define you, then you're probably going to be better off with your stock carb anyway. But anyway, I hope that this video can give you some more information about smart carbs and possibly even help you make your mind up. If it did, please hit the like button, let me know what you think about smart carbs or share your experience with them down in the comments and I'll see you on the next ride.